Well, wasn't that a blessing? Amen. Well, it's great to be with you tonight. I so appreciate uh, Pastor Neil asking me to come and be a part of things. I again apologize I couldn't be here uh, during those weeks. I almost died. Uh, it wasn't the food that kept me from here. It was the uh, one foot in the glory and one foot in the world. I wasn't really sure what was going to happen there for a while. I lost some weight during that time and I discovered something. I was not fat enough. It's a blessing. Those of you that are fat here tonight, I just want to say to you, I don't know how she's going to translate that over there, but nevertheless, um, thank God for it. That way, if you lose 20 pounds, you're still okay. Now, those of you little skinny birds out there, you better look out. You lose 20 pounds, you'll just drop and blow away. That's what'll happen. But anyway, it's great to be here. Uh, I am glad that my wife was able to come. Thank you all for having this on a Sunday instead of a Tuesday night when she has to be at her AA meeting, so thank you for that. We got down here safely, and I appreciate it. By the way, this is her first visit to Emmanuel Baptist Mosque. She's never been here before. <laughs> and so uh, we were coming down, and I said, you've been here before? She said, no. I, and so, when, you know, when you get off the little highway here, you see that this thing here <laughs> called a church. I said, that's it. She said, really? And uh, but anyway, by the way, I'd also like to thank you all for putting me in front of the horn section <laughs> so that I won't be able to hear for the next week and a half. So if you say amen tonight, I might not even know it. So you may have to wave your arms and shout. I'm not sure. So she got that translated good. I like that. I reckon she'll have to run around the room if I do. But anyway, it is great to be here. By the way, I don't normally like people in Florida. But I like y'all. Y'all are my friends. I appreciate what uh, Brother Greg said. And you are my friends. And I, I very much appreciate it. I count you. Uh, genuine friends, I really mean that with all my heart. We have aged together. We have, I mean, when I first met your pastor, um, I had a little more hair, and it was not quite this color. So it's turned gray and turned loose in that amount of time uh, that we have known one another. But it's been wonderful. I, I thought, too, we've been, we've been angry together. Like you said, the first time we met was uh, basketball. There's nobody I enjoy beating when our school plays than y'all. And there's nobody I hate losing to, worse than losing to y'all. I think that spells friendship somehow. We've had, uh, not me and him personally, but some of our players have had fights. And you know what? After all that, so would. Now, if if y'all had a girls team and you played our girls team, they'd have grudges for 30 years. But boys and men can fight, and they're fine about five minutes after the game's over. Say amen. Any of you men got a backbone? Please say amen right there. I know you're scared. Your wife's going to hit you in the ribs, but nevertheless. But we are friends, and I appreciate it so very much. I was going to say a little bit more about the... I have a few family members in Florida, so I have to say that I like them too, besides just liking y'all. But they're down around the Fort Myers area, and I intended to mention tonight that you didn't know that area unless you knew two really small places, Alva and Olga where I went and spent many summers with the roughest bunch of my mama's side of the family. That they were bad to drink and carry on, go to bars. And then I was talking earlier before the service, and would you know that Terry Harris knew everything about all the bars in that area? (laughs) He knew my family. All these years I've known him, I never knew that. I'm not sure if he spent some time in jail with him, but anyway, (laughs) Brother Terry, thank you for making me feel at home. I appreciate it. But it's just a joy to be here, and I'm just making some remarks because I'm nervous and scared to be up here preaching. But thank you again for for being my friend. Matter of fact, I've got people that get mad at me because I'm your friend. But you know what? I just decided they're probably going to be mad at me anyway. And I don't care if a hair lips the devil. I'm just going to be friends with y'all. That'd be all right. And if y'all will let me be your friend, I'll be. If I'm your only friend in Georgia, and I may be. But if I am, y'all are welcome in Ludowisi anytime. When y'all come up for a ball game, it doubles the population of our city. And I want to thank you so much for coming. All right, we've laughed a little bit. Let's get serious. Take your Bibles. 1 Peter chapter number 1. I want to begin reading in verse number 23 for the message tonight. And I want to read down into chapter number 2 as well down to verse number 3. So we'll read, I don't know, seven or eight verses of Scripture here. It's a great theme. I know your pastor has brought that to your attention. It's a great theme and it's a great message of Scripture to preach the Word. Now, I reckon you can sing the Word. I'm sure you can debate the Word. I know people who deny the Word. 
But the Bible doesn't tell us to do those things. It tells us to preach the Word. And so the focus there could well be on the word preach. A lot of people, again, do other things with the Word of God, but the Bible admonishes us to preach the Word. And I feel that maybe we have a little bit of a famine in our land of preaching the Word of God. I mean, I mean, now, again, there's people that talk it, and there's some that teach it. And I'm not opposed to talking about the Word, and I'm not opposed to teaching the Word. But I believe we ought to do more of preaching the Word of God. You know what brought conviction to me? Preaching the Word of God. You know what brought me to my knees? Preaching the Word of God. You know what pointed me to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? The preaching of the Word of God. God has chosen the foolishness of preaching, not the foolishness of preachers. We got enough of that, and I'm a prime example of it. But it's the foolishness of the preaching of the Word of God. So the focus could be on preach. And then it says, preach the, not some word. Not a word. Not some version. I mean, I know I'm at home here when I can say the King James Bible, and you know what I'm talking about. Most, I don't preach places that they don't understand that, but I have preached places where they're a little weak on it. Or the pastor's a little bit funny, and I don't mean that in the sense that he has a limp wrist, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, just a little bit afraid to take a little bit of a stand. What are we willing to take a stand for the Word of God? In the 70s, there was debate. I got saved in 1973. And not long after I got saved, there's a big debate in mostly Southern Baptist circles in those days about whether or not the Bible was the Word of God. What, well, I don't know if they ever got it settled, but we did, us independent folks. We got it settled that the Bible is the Word of God. Amen? It's inerrant, it's incorruptible, it's infallible, and a number of other things. But there came a talk later in the early 80s, and I'm old enough to have remembered those days a little bit, and that is that the debate became which one is the Word of God. I'm glad I've got that settled. I don't have to go to the bookstore and look at 26 versions. I know which one's the Word of God. This old blackback 66 right here is a King James Bible. And I believe it from cover to cover like the old preacher said. I even believe the cover because it says Holy Bible right there. This is the Word of God. So I'm to preach the and the Word. And I want you to look with me now at this passage of Scripture and let's see about the Word. Verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you again for the wonderful honor and privilege that's mine to be in this pulpit. Thank you for Pastor Neil allowing me the opportunity to take his place tonight. And I pray that in the moments we have together, thank you that we can laugh and have friendships and rejoice in good things and good memories. But Lord, in this time, while it's my turn, I pray that you'd help me to be emptied of sin and self and pride and ego and vanity, the things so often in a preacher's way. Fill me with your spirit. Pour me out to be a blessing to these dear people who I love. And I, I value their friendship. And I want to be a blessing to them tonight. So help me tonight as I speak to their ear. May your Holy Spirit speak to their heart and help us leave this place charged up to be better fitted and better willing to preach the Word of God. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is no greater source than the Word of God. There is no greater strength than the Word of God. There is no greater secret to the Christian life than the Word of God. Over the years as a pastor, I get asked that question sometimes, what's the secret to the Christian life? Well, I don't know why people are asking me, but my answer typically is this. There is no great secret except this. You get up in the morning and you read your Bible. And then you spend the day trying to do what it said. And then in the evening, you read your Bible. And of course, along throughout the day, you're supposed to be praying without ceasing. 
And then if you do that on Monday, when Tuesday rolls around, get up and do the same thing. And when Wednesday gets here, get up and do the same thing. Well, that sounds monotonous. Not if you know my Savior. God will bring things into your life, some, some of them that will astound you, some that will amaze you, some that will anger you. But in all of it, He'll give you something to lean upon and rest upon, and that is His divine Word. And I'm afraid in the day in which we live, we forget that as children of God, all of us that are believers in Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we forget that we've all experienced the same birth. It doesn't matter what your background is. According to verse number 23, I like that phrase, being born again. I'm not looking forward to getting born again. I is born again already. Well, that's not correct in English. It is in Ludowisi. And once our graduates get out at age of 18, we renew their birth certificate so they can play six more years of basketball. And so by that time, they've got their grammar down pat. But I'm saying this much, we've all experienced the same birth. We read here in verse number 22 about the unfeigned love of the brethren. By the way, that's what all Christians ought to do is love one another. And We live in a day when people forget that. We also should enjoy the same nourishment. We read in chapter 2 in verse number 2 about the newborn babes desiring the sincere milk of the Word of God. There is this book, this Word that we are to take, learn, apply, and preach There is its milk, there is its meat, the stronger things of the Word of God, and there is that manna, some of those special handfuls of purpose that the Lord drops in your lap every now and then, and you don't normally share them with everybody. It's just like the Lord gave you a little nugget there that you can just say, man, that's good. And sometimes you try and share it with somebody, and they look at you sideways like, what's wrong with you? Because you got a special treat from the Lord. So I want to say this to you. When we're thinking about the Word of God, we must be careful that we're not too casual with it. The average Christian leaves their Bible anywhere they want to. They leave it on their desk and they've got five books stacked on top of it. I think you ought to put it on top. I know that's kind of weird, but let me be weird for a moment, if you would. I'd like to be Frank, but Frank's back home in our church. But anyway, (laughs) would you all tell the blondes that joke later? Maybe they'll catch it. But anyway... I don't like to see people pull up in our parking lot and they got Bibles on the back dash of their car that's been sitting there all week. I fear that if we blew all the dust off of all the Bibles in South Georgia, we'd have a dust storm that choked all the Vidalia onion fields and we wouldn't have anything to eat. Because people are too casual with the Word of God. They don't treat it with respect and honor and dignity. And I'm saying this much, it is a book to be respected. It is a book to be honored. It is a book that has dignity and it ought to be preached all over this world starting from our homes. We are sometimes too caustic with it. Many a parent has learned this with teenagers when they simply try to take the Bible literally and beat it into the head. I say to you tonight, unless the Word of God gets in somebody's heart, it ain't going to do no changing. God's Word's got to get in our heart. And sometimes we are, we got to take our stand. We have to believe the Bible. We got to be firm in what we believe. But we have to be sure that we speak the truth in love. So that people know that we care about them. Not just we care about them changing. We really genuinely love them. I believe, uh, I don't remember who it was, but years ago somebody put this in my mind. That we have to love people where they are. To help them to get to where they need to be. And that's many a student we've had in our school. Many a soul that's gotten saved in our area. They were a little rough around the edges. Have y'all met some of the rednecks up our way? I bet they're a lot like some of the rednecks down here in Florida. A little rough around the edges. Do you know many of y'all when you first got saved was real rough around the edges? Some of y'all are now. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Say amen. You understand? You know what will help you is the Word of God. And it's not just toting your Bible. It's not an amulet that you carry around as a lucky charm that you walk around with that automatically changes you some type magically uh, through some process. It's the Word of God that's got to get inside of you. And you know how it gets inside of you? Sometimes because your Sunday school teacher teaches it and your pastor gets up and preaches and that fills you with the Word of God so you can go out and do something with it. Now I want to give you some things tonight just by way of sharing. With By the way, don't be too cautious with the Bible. Don't be afraid to share it. Don't be afraid to preach it. Some of y'all would remember and have probably read about the great uh, circuit-riding Methodist preacher Peter Cartwright, who on one occasion was in his pulpit getting ready to preach. He was sitting up on the platform, and somebody came and whispered to him and said, Now, Mr. Cartwright, you do know that President Andrew Jackson 
is in the service this morning. So you might want to be careful about your remarks. Mr. Cartwright got up and said, I understand President Andrew Jackson is in our services this morning. And I want to say this, Andrew Jackson is going to hell if he don't repent. When the service was over with, they say Andrew Jackson came up to Mr. Cartwright and said this, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could whoop the world. Amen and amen again. It's a day in which we live that we need to stand for the truth and preach the word of God. And if you're an older preacher, keep preaching it. If you're a young preacher like me, keep preaching it. I don't appreciate y'all laughing at that. Many of you know that I was born back in 19, none of your business. And so we're going to move on. I give you three or four things tonight. We'll be done. Now, brother, uh, your pastor told me, I asked him, it was about, I don't know, 6.05 on the clock back there. And I said, what time do y'all normally get out? He said, 6.30. You know, pastors ought not lie in church. I mean, if he's at Walmart, I understand it. But he's in church. Y'all not lie here. All right, notice with me this, if you would. Verse 23, being born again. This is chapter 1, verse 23 of 1 Peter. Some of y'all still trying to find it. It's right after 2 Hezekiah. Would you find it, please? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Number one, notice with me the deposit, the deposit of the word of God. Somewhere, I don't know where it was for you. I'm not real sure where it was for me. But somewhere in my life, God's word was deposited in me as a seed. And God put that in there. I don't know when it was. It might have been when I was a little boy and went to vacation Bible school and first heard the name Jesus. And all I saw was a flannel graph. All I can remember from those days, I was probably seven. All I remember was flannel graph, a picture of a long-haired Jesus, cookies, and Kool-Aid. I think the teacher was Jim Jones. I'm not sure. Perhaps you're familiar with the name. That's all I remember. I don't remember anybody bringing up salvation. I don't remember anybody telling me I was lost. Nobody really preached the word. We just kind of had cookies and Kool-Aid and we went on our way. But somewhere, it might have been that time. It might have been the first time I walked in a Baptist church and heard a preacher with a backbone like a saw log and lungs of leather that stood up and preached the word of God and said, if you don't get right with God, you're going to bust hell wide open. I don't know when it was. But somewhere along the way, God planted a seed in my heart. He deposited that word in me, being born again. Now listen to me. You're not born again apart from the word of God. You cannot be born again without the word of God. Can I get it? Y'all understand what I'm saying? So if you don't have, listen, if you don't have a Bible, you can't be born again without the word of God. And I happen to think you need the incorruptible word because that's what's talked about here. I think that's the King James Bible. I'm just saying this much. There's a lot of folks talk about the being born again, having some kind of experience, and yet they deny the truth of Scripture as if the Bible doesn't mean anything. Some of you are old enough to remember back in the days when they had these bumper stickers that was out, pretty popular at the time, that said this, God's Word. I believe it. That settles it. I don't agree. I think it's this, it's the Bible is God's word and that settles it, whether you believe it or not. But I'm here to announce to you tonight that somewhere along the way, God had to deposit his word in your heart. And I would add to that, after you're born again, you ought to be making regular deposits to the bank account of your heart from the word of God. Well, preacher, I thought this was about preaching the Word. You don't understand. If you don't know the Word, have the Word, believe the Word, deposit the Word, cherish the Word, you won't care nothing about preaching it. It doesn't mean anything to you. I looked over here and I saw that bunch of ugly boys right there and it just startled me. And then I noticed they had the young ladies, the beautiful young ladies sitting on the back. That's wonderful. Can you boys spell rap? Never mind, we'll move on. Y'all go to school at Berea and we'll have to check that grammar. But anyway, we'll move on. What I'm saying this as I look over there and I think about this. One day them boys may grow up and be preachers of the Word of God. They ought to know it and cherish it. And I'm going to say this to all the teenagers, wherever you're sitting at, anywhere in here, or any adults that might have the same addiction, don't let your cell phone become more important to you than your Bible. Back home, we got four or five knuckleheads. Well, actually probably four or five hundred knuckleheads that if you took their cell phone away and chunked it in the river, they'd have a heart attack. And scream bloody murder. No! 
But if you took their Bible and flung it in the bushes somewhere, they wouldn't be too upset about it. You ought to cherish your Bible because without this book being deposited in your life, you'd have never got born again. You'd have never got saved. All the other corrupt ones that are out there would do you no good whatsoever. Somewhere, God put his word, planted his word, placed it in your heart so that you would have an opportunity to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and then take that word and share it with a lost and dying world. For me, that spot of planet Earth is a... Long County, Georgia. Ludowissa, Georgia. That's building up now. We're getting a lot of new houses built in there. And though the locals complain about it because it's made traffic. You know, we got seven cars at the light instead of two now. <laughs> we only have one traffic light. I said, you can't change this. Y'all ever put another traffic light in town? I have to change my sermons all across America. Because I talk about the one traffic light town. But it's changing. And you know what the good thing is? The good thing is it's an opportunity for more people to hear the word of God and for God to deposit his word in their heart like he did in mine. And I'm so grateful he did. There's an ear gate through which God can deposit his word. There's an eye gate through which God can deposit his word. There's a tasting, oh taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. There's the touching, the handling, the feeling. I don't know about you, but I like holding on to my Bible. I like feeling that thing. I like toting that thing in the church. Can I get an amen? Do y'all like doing that? I mean, that just feels proper. I almost feel, if I went to church and didn't have my Bible, I'd feel naked. And that's an image you don't want in your mind. But we'll move on. Number two is this. Notice with me in verse number 24, the durability of the Word of God. It says this, for all flesh is as grass. The last part of verse 23 said, which liveth and abideth forever. Verse 24, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away. But watch verse 25, but the Word of the Lord endureth forever. God's Word is durable. My first message that I ever preached was in the mid-1970s. I got saved in 73, somewhere around 74, 75, somewhere in that span of time. I was asked to fill in and preach my first sermon ever at our little Baptist church in Valdosta, Georgia. My wife and I met there. She was part of the AA team. And, uh, but I'm kidding there. Okay, we both sang in the choir and uh, we met one another. She fell in love with a handsome thing like I was. And I'm telling you what's the truth. I've been a blessing to her ever since. But anyway... (laughs) During that time, during that time that we were there at that church, and I was asked to fill in. We didn't have a pastor at the time. We were in between pastors. I was asked to fill in on a Wednesday night. I chose as my text Proverbs chapter 6, verses, I think it's 16 and 17 right there, where it speaks about there are six things that the Lord doth hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And I knew right away I had seven points. And so I thought this, that'll last me at least an hour and a half. And I knew several of the deacons pretty well in the church, and they needed every one of those seven things that the Lord doth hate. And I was determined to let them have every one of them. And I got up and preached those seven points, and in about seven minutes I was done. And so I prayed a real long prayer to make it up to ten minutes, and that was it. Now my point in saying that is this. The Bible that I preached from then is the same Bible I preach from now. That book has lasted lo these many years. But you know what? We can go back a generation before me, and preachers that are preaching today were preaching it then. And by the way, I happen to be of of this notion that you can go all the way back to the days of the Apostle Paul, and he's preaching the same book that we're preaching. Now, I'm not an idiot. I know he didn't have a King James Bible, but he had a Bible that agreed with the King James Bible. And I want to say this to you. I do believe in this book, but I'm not mad about it. I'm not up in arms going to shoot one another about it. But this book will endure. It has endured all of my preaching life, all of my saved life. It has endured all of my natural life. And it will endure after my natural life is over. The next generation will have a book to preach. The next missionaries will have a book to carry to the foreign field. The next teachers of the Word of God in a Sunday school class, the next ones that are in a Christian school, they'll still have a Bible because it is a durable Word. It endures. It abides. It abides forever. Psalm 119 verse 89, Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. 
Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It endures. It works. It lasts. And it will never fade away. It will never depart. We'll have it for every generation that ever needs it. So there will be no one ever unequipped to preach the word. You can go to a seminary and run out of things to preach. You can go to a Bible college and run out of outlines that you borrowed from your professors and seemingly have nothing to preach. But as long as you preach the Bible, you'll always have something to preach. Number one, the deposit of the word. Number two, the durability of the word. That is its strength. It just doesn't endure in the sense of lasting, but it still has the same strength and power today than it did. Can I explain it to you this way? It doesn't diminish. It doesn't wear out. Again, I'm, I'm 66 years of age. I know I look 106. And you think I was born during the Lincoln administration, but I wasn't. But as, as I've gone through years and years of life, my strength has diminished. I don't have quite the energy. Now, my mind can think about it. The other day, we had some students out in our, it was the last week of school, some students out in the yard, and they were kicking around a soccer ball, which I don't think is football anyway, right? That ain't real football. Can I get amen? Now, well, there's just a few of you soccer people here. Y'all are a little weird. That's a European game. If you like that, go over yonder and play. Now, around here, we got real football. Who was the national champions last year? I can forget. Oh, that's right. It was the Bulldog. Well, let's move. I'm sorry, but it was in the sermon notes. I had to say it. <laughs> hey, Brother Billy. Good to see you down there. <laughs> Florida's a wonderful state. It's a foreign field, as far as I'm concerned, for missionaries. But anyway, I was out there, and I saw that soccer ball, and he's kicking here and kicking there. I thought, well, there ain't nothing to it. Next time it rolled, you're getting ahead of me, Brother Farber. Don't get ahead of me. <laughs> He's already seeing me crippled in a wheelchair from swinging it. So it rolled up. I said, I got it. And I ran out there, which is like about this. And I swung my foot to kick. And I'm telling you what's true. It like to broke my foot. I said, I'm trying to think. The whole time I'm in the motion of swinging my leg, I'm thinking, side of my foot, end of my shoe, top of my foot. And I don't even know which part hit, but it hurt. The only thing I know that hurt worse is an ingrown toenail. Can I get an amen right there? Anybody ever had an ingrown toenail? Oh, my goodness. I remember going to the doctor one time, and he had to do something with that. And he said, we're going to take that out. I didn't know what that meant. And I turned around, and I seen him pull this syringe out that had a needle on it about that long. And the name of that thing was, this is going to hurt. And then I turned around and called, Lord God, help me. Lord, help me. Please help me. Give me strength. I don't want to cry like a baby in front of the doctor. And this nurse, she's a woman. I'll look like a, you know what. And I don't want to do that. And I turned back around and he had another needle. And you know what it said? This is going to hurt worse. I'm telling you what's true. That's bad. But nothing hurt, nothing hurt me recently as bad as that trying to kick that ball. My mind could do it. But my physical attributes have diminished. They've gotten weaker. And if I live much longer, they'll get weaker and weaker and the day will come when I don't even know who y'all are. Hey, brother, good to see you. That's why brother and sister are good names in the church. <laughs> hey, brother, good to see you. How's your wife doing? How's your husband doing? Good to see you, sister. We're so glad to have you today. And I walk away and say to my wife, who was that? <laughs> and that was your cousin <laughs> from Alba. The Bible, Brother Harris is like four notes behind everybody. Did you notice that? The durab what I mean by that is the Word of God lasts, and it maintains its strength. You see, I believe the Bible is just as powerful today as it was in the days of Moses, just as it was in the days of Paul, just as it was the days of Dr. Hiles or J. Frank Norris or any great man of God. I believe it's just as powerful today as it was then. A third thing I'd like you to notice in chapter number 2 is the desire. The word is actually in the text. Verse 2 of chapter 2 is newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. I don't think there that Peter was saying that these people were just newborn babes. Some of them no doubt were. But he's making the point that we should desire the word of God like a newborn baby desires milk. Not that you 
are. I'm not accusing you tonight of being just a babe in Christ that you struggle with the emotions and the social issues of our day and you've never grown in the grace of God. I'm not suggesting that. You could be the most mature Christian in the audience tonight, but you should still desire the Word of God like a baby desires it. As newborn, that's what he's saying, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby. God help us when we get to that point where we think this, I don't need to grow anymore. All of us do. I still want God to show me something fresh. I believe you can go to the same verse. You go to John 3, 16 a million times and still find something fresh and something new and that God can bless your heart with it. And I don't want to ever get to the point of being so arrogant and so full of myself and my own mentality to think this, I have arrived, I have learned all I can learn, and now I'm just going to sit over here and sort of uh, sizzle in the juices of my wonderful knowledge. God help us to always have a desire for His Word. To me, this is the simplicity of all of it. I need, now listen, I need to know it so I can grow with it and then I can take it and go. One of my biggest fears when I first started soul winning, knocking on doors, was I'm going to knock on the door and the person behind that door is going to ask me a question that I don't know the answer to because I don't know my Bible well enough. I haven't studied it. I haven't memorized it. I haven't uh, learned the doctrines of it and so forth. And you know what I found out? Even after all these years, people still ask me questions that I don't know. Brother Sellers, you've been in the ministry a long time. There's things you still don't know? Yeah. Like when somebody says, why did God let my baby die? You know the answer to that? No, you don't. You think you do. And even if you know everything about that person's life, you don't really know. Would you have been there as Job's three friends to instruct him on why everything happened to Job? Then you're a little too caustic with the word. You need to just back off a minute. Now, I will say something about Job's friends. They did come, and when they arrived, they sat there with their mouth shut for seven days. You got any friends like that? I don't. They all arrive, and they want to say something. And everybody seems to have an answer. I don't have an answer. Now, in the early days of knocking on doors, I got things like this. Who are the 144,000? And I came up, I had a good answer. I said, I don't know, but there wasn't a church last Sunday. <laughs> and of course, you know that classic one they always ask you. Who was Cain's wife? Well, that's easy. It was his mother-in-law's daughter. And there you go. Now, several of y'all are going to say, I'm going to have to go home and study that. Well, you do. Please do. Get my email. It's gregneal at berean.com. This desire, as I understand it, is an intense craving for possession of. Most of us, because our connections first came with sports, so we know what it is to desire to get better at an athletic skill or what it is to face someone in athletic competition. And so we have a desire, a drive, if you would. Something that says this on the other side of that wall and we've got to go through it. And we make up our mind that we're going to do it. I believe we need more of that if we are to preach the word in our day. We need more people, can I say it this way, that want to. The simplest definition I could give for desire is it's a want to. I want to read my Bible. I don't read it as much as I should, but I want to. Let me say this too. If you're here tonight and you have no desire for this book, if you're saved, something's wrong. You may not be saved, but if you are, if you know Christ is your Savior, but you don't, you ignore your Bible, you don't pay attention to it, you don't want to read it, you don't want it to guide your life. I feel, I feel sorry for you. But I also, I gotta, just got to say this to you. Something's not right in your spiritual life if you don't have some desire. Now, everybody's going to say this. I want more desire for God's Word. I, I'm with you. I'm raising both hands. That's me. I want to desire it more. I want to learn it more. I want to know it more. And my belief is that the more I get it in me, and at some point it sort of overflows and... I want to share it. I want to give it. I want to preach it. 
I'm convinced that the best preachers of the Word of God are those who get full of God and His Word and they get in the pulpit and it just overflows. They don't have to manufacture it. They don't have to somehow muster it up somehow. It just comes out of them because it's a natural progression from what God has put inside of them. But I don't think God handpicks preachers and says, I'm going to do it for them, but I won't do it for my other children. God will do it for all His youngins. He loves all of us alike. All you got to do is have a willingness. Do you want it? Do you desire it? Do you seek it? Do you crave it? We should. The last and final thing tonight is in verse 1 of chapter 2. The demand of the Word of God. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. God's Word is not a static thing. It is a dynamic thing. By static, I mean not that it creates static when you rub your feet on the carpet and touch somebody and it shocks them. We all know that kind of static. Or, you know, your hair goes to standing up high because you got static electricity. Or your pantyhose don't work just right because you got static electricity. Yes, I said pantyhose. All right, here, let's move on. Three of y'all woke up when I said that. And thank you, by the way, for doing that. Hey, did you hear what he said? I can't believe that. Y'all will go home and talk about that one thing for the next six months and wonder if I'll say it next time. But I'm talking about static in the sense of it doesn't move. It's just there. Has no power, has no unction, has no ability. It's just there. Like some folks walk into some churches and they got a big family Bible on the communion table. And it just sits there. Nobody ever opens it. It's got dust on it. When I first came to Ludowisi, the previous pastor, it was somebody had donated a family Bible to the church when the church was starting. And so they set it on the communion table in place of flowers. It was just there. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. Nobody meant anything by it. But when you looked at it, people just saw it as like some kind of a relic that you just go and bow down and worship it without ever opening it, without listening to it. Nobody preach it. Nobody taught from it. It was just there. It was a thing. Not unlike people have maybe a picture of Jesus in their sanctuary somewhere, which is ridiculous to me, but some do. I think it's crazy because I know that's not what he looked like. <clears throat> but anyway... <clears throat> Let me finish up by saying this. <clears throat> Excuse me. The demand of the word is this, that it is not a static thing that just sits there and has no effect. It is a dynamic thing. The Bible even speaks about that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God in the gospel is the preached word of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that you're a sinner and you need a Savior, and if you'll trust Him, He'll save you. All of that is wrapped up in the dynamite, the dunamis, the power of God. And this book is a powerful book, but it, listen to me, it makes demands of us. According to Hebrews chapter number 4, it is, a, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You ever read the Bible? And it seems like, how did the Bible know that I was thinking that? And I just read some verses that said I shouldn't be thinking that. You don't run your mouth gossiping about Sister Flapjaw. And then you open your Bible up and you start reading about you shouldn't be gossiping. How did that happen? Did I go over there and open your Bible up and say, this is what you need to read? <laughs> gotcha. No, the Bible has that power and it makes demands upon our life. You can't read the Bible and it not make a demand upon you. Part of that demand is to straighten your life up. I ain't got nothing that needs to be straightened out. You ought to be the first one at the altar tonight. Wherefore, laying aside all malice. That's something that doesn't necessarily... You can smile on the outside and inside hate somebody's guts right on the other side of the church. All guile, that's deceitfulness. When you're faking it, when you're pretending, when you're trying to make everybody think you love God and you, you're uh, right with Him when you're really not. He goes on to say in hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. God's Word demands I quit that jump. God's word demands I lay those things aside. The words he used there are laying aside. I put it away from me. I'm convinced of this, that a whole lot of people are praying about things they don't need to be praying about. You ain't got to pray. Lord, now you don't want me to quit gospel. If you do now, I'd be happy to do it. You don't need to pray about that. Just shut up. Well, you know, I was thinking about committing adultery. Lord, you reckon I should do that? Speak to my heart. What? Thou shalt not commit adultery. You ain't got to pray about that. 
Well, I was thinking about robbing the bank because I'd like to have a lot of money to give to Pastor Neil because I know he's going to take some money up. He always does. And so I'm going to have some money and I want to give it. I'm going to rob a bank. Whoa. Thou shalt not steal. You don't have to pray about it. Achan takes something from Jericho and he's hidden in his tent. And the sin, the sin of the camp caused a great de- defeat at the battle of Ai. And so Joshua goes in Joshua 7, hits his knees and begins talking to God about the problem in the church. And the Lord said, I'm paraphrasing, but get up. It ain't time to pray. It's time to do something about it. We're living today when everybody wants to pray about stuff when they need to do something about it. God's word demands make a change. Put it down. Leave it alone. Walk away from it. Leave the relationship. Get rid of those friends. Because listen to me. As long as you hang on to those things in verse 1, and you'll be read them another time, or the Holy Ghost will bring it back up to your mind even after I'm done preaching. And if you hang on to those things right there, you will not preach the word. With your life or with your lips or knocking on somebody's door or wherever you may have the opportunity to do so. I'll close with this. I mentioned earlier about Peter Cartwright, another great man. Goes back to the days of the martyrs. You can read this in Fox's book of martyrs of Hugh Latimer who on one occasion was in his pulpit to preach the word in that day. And someone came up and told him, Mr. Latimer, Henry VIII is in the services. And he thought to himself, he said, he said to himself these words, Hugh Latimer, you better be careful what you say today because the king is in the service. And he said after a few moments, he thought further and he said, Hugh Latimer, you better be careful because you're preaching for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Be mindful what you say in His presence. Can I challenge you tonight? Love this Word. Make it real to you and fill yourself up to overflowing and you will preach the Word. It'll just be a natural growth out of how much this book should mean to you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the good attention these folks have given as I've shared your word tonight.